Good morning. It's lovely to join with you again to worship the Lord on this his day. We read in Psalm 47 and verses 1 and 2 these words. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth.
Let's pray together. Our God, we come to meet with you today, and along with the psalmist we can exclaim, How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. You are the Lord Most High. You are high and lifted up, far above us in your glory. And yet, through Jesus Christ, we can approach you. We know that on our own we could never hope to come into your presence, for you are a holy God and we are a sinful people. And yet, through your Son, you made that way. Your great love and mercy and compassion are seen throughout the Scriptures. And this day we simply bow in your presence in awe of your goodness again. This morning we are joined together as your people in our own homes. But we know that we're also joined with your people throughout this country and throughout this whole world. We're joined with that great multitude of believers all over the world and through all of time as we express our love to you and as we worship you. We praise and thank you for the fellowship of other believers that you have given to us. You know, Lord, how quickly we become discouraged and disheartened if we're left on our own. For you created us in community. And so you have made a new community of mankind, a redeemed people, your church. We have been bought with the precious blood of Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you will forgive us for those times when we have thought or said or done things that have caused harm to your church. We know we have such a high view of our triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And yet at times we can behave in despicable ways towards your church. Lord, forgive us. And we pray that you will accept the worship that we bring to you this day as your people. That as we lift your name high, you will fill our hearts with joy. We ask that you will speak to us as we meet around your word, and that you will work in our hearts to make us into people who are passionate about you and your glory. Amen. Boys and girls, do you ever worry about something that isn't important? Do you ever get so busy that you forget to spend time with God? Sometimes we get so busy playing that, that we forget, or sometimes we just get busy doing things for ourselves. And if we don't take time to read the Bible or pray, we can easily forget about God. Did you know there's a story in the Bible about that? We can read it in Luke chapter 10 and verses 38 to 42. In fact, let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 10 and we'll read together from verse 38. Let's hear God's word. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. But only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Amen. Martha had invited Jesus into her home. And when the men sat down to listen to Jesus teach about God, the women were usually working around the house. They would prepare food for the guests and clean up after the meals. And Martha was getting really quite angry because Mary was sitting and listening to Jesus, and she wasn't helping with all the chores. Martha was so busy, she was cooking and setting the table and, and doing all these things, and she just wanted some help. And so she complained to Jesus, 
and asked him to tell Mary to help her out. She didn't stop to think about what she was saying. She just knew that she didn't want to do it all herself. Now Jesus didn't get on to Mary or Martha about what either one of them were doing. He knew that Martha was worried. And so he tried to calm her down and settle her down. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you're worried and upset about many things. He gently got Martha's attention and told her that she was worried and upset about, about something that really wasn't very important. And he then guided her to what was important. Jesus went on, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Jesus was telling busy Martha that Mary was thinking about God. Mary was sitting quietly at the feet of Jesus, not cleaning the dirty dishes, not cooking, not sweeping. She was just spending a quiet moment with the Master. Jesus said that she had made a wise decision and that she would benefit from it. He highly praised her for quietly spending time with God. Today and every day, let's remember to make time to spend it with Jesus. We can read our Bibles, and we can pray, and we can worship God together as families. And let's try to remember that when things get busy, it's still important to spend time with God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story about Mary and Martha and the example of spending time with you that Mary has set. Help us to always make time to be with you and to spend time with you and to worship you and to learn from you that we might become the people that you would want us to be. Amen. Please turn with me to Psalm 122 and we'll read this psalm together. Psalm 122 and beginning to read at verse 1. This is God's word. I rejoiced with those who said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. There the thrones for judgment stand, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my brothers and friends, I will say, Peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. Amen. Do you remember last time in Psalm 120, we saw the psalmist is a long, long way away from Jerusalem. He tells us that he's in Meshech and he's in the tents of Kedar. And wherever they are, they're a long way from Jerusalem. And then Psalm 121, which I believe you've looked at uh, as well. It's a favourite psalm of many people. And I believe in that psalm, the psalmist is within sight of Jerusalem and he sees the, the hills that surround Mount Zion. And the hills are, are filled with dangers and so he sends up that prayer. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? And of course, the great answer then comes, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And now we come to Psalm 122. And it's obvious immediately that the psalmist has now arrived in Jerusalem. He's there. He's finally arrived at his destination. Now, I want you to try to imagine with me today that there is no a streaming of services and no radio and the churches are closed and the only place where you can hear the word of God being preached and proclaimed is if you go to London. I want you to imagine that the only place where you can get assurance that your sins are truly forgiven is in London. I want you to imagine that the only place where you can gather with the Lord's people and experience worship on the grand scale as it's meant to be experienced, the only place that can happen in the world is in London. Now you might say, Stuart, that's really strange. That's a bizarre thing to ask us to imagine. But that's how it was for the people of God in the Old Testament. The only place at this period in time when the word, where the word of God was proclaimed was in Jerusalem. And the only place where you could go and be assured by a sacrificial system that your sins were forgiven, the only place that happened was in Jerusalem. And the only place where you would experience worship on a grand scale amongst all the brothers and sisters in the Lord was in Jerusalem. So hopefully you get a sense of excitement and thrill and anticipation that would have been rising in the heart of this old covenant believer. The pilgrim is making his way to Jerusalem and he's finally arrived. Verse 2, our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. The first thing that we see in this wonderful psalm is the joy at being present in Jerusalem. Now, I remember going to London for the first time when I was just nine or ten years old, I think, uh, and I went with my brother to stay with our aunt for a week's holiday. And she took us to see many of the sights, and we found ourselves in this huge city with the bright lights and huge streets and buildings and all the places you'd seen on television and heard about. I remember the fascination of seeing Buckingham Palace for the first time and the Houses of Parliament and even 10 Downing Street. And we got to see and play around on HMS Belfast. And here is the psalmist. And he now finds himself in Jerusalem, this magnificent city with all of its history, with all of its significance. He pauses at the entrance to the city and his heart is filled with joy. Perhaps he's just passed through one of the gates of the city walls of Jerusalem and he pauses to take it all in. He's standing in this great city, the city which for the Old Testament worshipper has the significance that God is found here. 
This is the only city in the world where God was to be found. This is where the temple was. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was. This is where the sacrifices would be offered. This is where the the 20,000 or so Levitical priests did their work. And at a time of celebration like Passover, the population of the city would quadruple. It would be bustling with people. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Let's go to the temple. Let's go to one of these great festivals. There's a sense of great pleasure. There's a sense of great joy at being present in Jerusalem. It's the sense of joy that the old covenant worshipper felt at being in the house of God. Now Jerusalem for us, of course, is far more wonderful than that city which stands in the Middle East. Jerusalem, for us as New Covenant worshippers, is the church. It's the body of Christ. It's made up of those for whom Christ has died. So I wonder, are you glad when you think of joining with your church? You see, this psalm is showing us that there should be a sense of joy and celebration every time we gather as a church. We are part of God's covenant people, and we are meeting with our God. And when things open up again, I hope there will be a spring in your step as you go to the prayer meeting. I hope there will be a great sense of anticipation as you enter your building on a Sunday. I wonder, do you know what it is to long for the Lord's day? The psalmist in this psalm, he says, I rejoiced. There was a sense of joy. We can find ourselves approaching our worship services with a spirit of detachment. Sure, we've been here before. It's something we do every week. It's almost automatic. Meeting as a church is just something that we do at weekends. And sometimes we've lost that sense of joy. We've lost that sense of gladness. We've lost that sense of anticipation that I'm sure some of you will remember. Do you remember perhaps uh, shortly after you were converted and there was a thrill in your heart about reading the Bible and about coming together with God's people to, to worship him, to exalt him, to pray together? I rejoiced the psalmist says, and he finds himself in this big city with all of its history and all of its significance, and it reminded him of the presence of God in terms of old covenant worship. I wonder what it says to us about the privileges that we have when we gather as a church. David Clarkson was an assistant to John Owen, that great Puritan theologian, towards the end of Owen's ministry in London. Uh, In fact, he was the minister who would preach at John John Owen's funeral service. And David Clarkson wrote an article of great significance, which I read recently. The article has a very daring title. The title is this. Public worship is to be preferred before private worship. Now, that's a very daring title for a time when we aren't able to gather together for public worship, isn't it? But that's what he writes. Public worship is to be preferred before private worship. You and I, we live in a day and age when we're the centre of the universe. But when we get our minds back into the teaching of the Scriptures, we discover a corporate identity as the people of God. And there is something deeply significant about gathering together with the Lord's people as the body of Christ. I rejoiced, the psalmist said. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So this psalm speaks of the joy of being present in Jerusalem. But the second thing I want us to see in this psalm is how much the beauty of Jerusalem is appreciated. Look at verses 3 to 5. The psalmist mentions a number of things. He mentions, first of all, in verse 3, that the city was built in a way that was compact. There was something solid about the city, something permanent. 
about the structure of Jerusalem. Well, I imagine all cities look like that to country boys going to the big city, coming from tents and hamlets and small villages to this great stone city. It's massive fortress-like walls. It's huge stone temple. Can you see the psalmist as he begins now to walk around the city and he sees all the shops and the houses and the administrative buildings and it's all so magnificent. There is something great about it, something solid about this city, something significant about this city. You see, the church isn't some weak, trivial, unimportant thing. That's what the world thinks of the church, isn't it? Outside in the world, people think that the church is insignificant. It's just not important. But for the psalmist, it was the most magnificent thing that he had ever seen. Now, the church might well at times seem like a shabby little thing in comparison to the world. If you've ever been in a small, struggling country church that that struggles to find a preacher in the Lord's Day and struggles to pay the heating bills, you may well think that, yeah, the, the church is insignificant. But there is something magnificent about a church. There is something special about the church of God because it is built upon the rock. It is built upon Jesus Christ. And it's built upon mighty, solid foundations. And it has solid walls. It is majestic. The church of Jesus Christ is majestic. There's a wonderful story told about John Knox when, just before his death in in 1562, a friar had accused the Church of Scotland as being a new thing. The church was, was just eight years old at the time, and the friar mocked the Church of Scotland as being a new thing. John Knox turned to him and he said, The Church of Scotland is the church of our fathers and the church of the apostles, and the church of the prophets, and the church of Moses, and the church of Abraham. You could have heard a pin drop when John Knox said that. You see, a church that holds firmly to Christ and his word is a significant and a majestic place. But there's something else here too we see the diversity and the unity of the worshippers. The psalm speaks of the tribes of the Lord in verse 4. Imagine this worshipper. Now you have to put yourself back into the Old Testament. and You're maybe coming in from the country and all you've ever known is one single tribe. The only accent you've ever heard is your own. But when the psalmist comes to Jerusalem, he's impressed by the fact that all the tribes are there. All the people of God, the twelve tribes, the the coastal dwellers of Zebulon, the highlanders of Dan, the farmers of Ephraim, the desert dwellers of Reuben, they're all there. All of the tribes are gathering. And of course, they're not all the same, are they? They all have their distinctive qualities and attributes. And that's the glory of the church. We're not all the same. We don't all speak the same. We don't all look the same. God has made each one of us different. You know, it's the cults that want sameness. But we can glory in our diversity, just as the psalmist does here. The diversity and the unity of the worshippers of God. Remember the vastness of the work of Jesus Christ, that he intends to call people from every tribe and every nation and every tongue into the church of Jesus Christ. So there is no place for racism or bigotry of any kind in the church of Christ. But there's something else that he notices here too, because in Jerusalem he gets direction from the king, and he mentions that in verse 5. There the thrones for judgment stand, the thrones of the house of David. Now what's he talking about? Well, if you lived out in the country, justice could be hard to find. If you were in a dispute with a neighbour about some land contract, you'd have to go to the nearest city to find justice, And you'd go to the gates of the city, to the elders who would be sitting there. And the high court would be in Jerusalem itself. 
And as the psalmist enters into Jerusalem and he now begins to walk around, he suddenly comes to realise that it's here in this city that things are put right. It's here that wrongs are righted. You know, it's a great thing to belong to the Church of Jesus Christ. In life, many people have been wronged. You may go through this world living with the injustice of that wrong. But we worship a God who is perfectly just and who on the day of judgment will put every wrong right when sin will be punished with pure justice. And the psalmist is greatly impressed by that. So secondly, we see this sense of appreciation about the beauties of Jerusalem, its majesty, its unity, its justice. And then thirdly, the psalmist prays for the peace of Jerusalem. In the very heart of this man, there is a love for this city and a concern for the well-being of the city. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. Look at verse 6. Now Jerusalem means king of Salem or, or king of peace. And it sounds like city of peace. And what does the psalmist pray for? Notice the repetition of the word within there in verse 7 and then again in, in verse 8. It's three times there. He wants peace within Jerusalem. But there might be no division, no civil war, no disunity, no fighting, no traitors within the walls. Pray for Jerusalem. When you hear of division, pray for the church of Jesus Christ. That's what this psalm is saying. Pray for the sake of my brothers. Pray for those who live within this city. But higher still, pray for the sake of the Lord our God. Pray for the glory of God in this city. Pray that within this city, God in all his glory and in all his majesty might be exalted. But the psalm doesn't end there, does it? It doesn't end with a prayer. The psalmist goes on because the psalm ends with a resolution. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity, he says. And do you understand what he's saying? After experiencing the joy of arriving in Jerusalem and after noting some of the wonders of the city of Jerusalem, he now decides that he will give himself entirely for the kingdom of God. But what does this psalm mean for us today? Well, he's saying, because you are a member of the church of Christ, because by faith God has brought you into union with Jesus, and therefore into union with each other as brothers and sisters, I will give whatever it takes to build up the glory of God in the church of Jesus Christ. I will do whatever I can to exalt God within the church. And the psalmist seeks to answer his prayer within himself. Now I think there's a lesson here for us. How many times have we prayed a prayer like the psalmist prays without realising that the answer to our prayer actually lies within ourselves? The psalmist is saying, I'm praying for the peace of Jerusalem and in order that that peace might be brought about, I'll give myself totally to that purpose. I'll be whatever God wants me to be. I'll give my time, I'll give my money, I'll give my talents, I'll give everything that I have for the sake of the house of God and for the sake of God and for his glory. Is there anything more wonderful in all the world and to pray for the prosperity of Jerusalem and the house of God. Is there a better prayer than to pray that God would be honoured and glorified and set apart within his church for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the gospel? I live and I'll die for God's kingdom, the psalmist is saying. His whole life is taken up with what God is doing in the city of Jerusalem in his church. May that be our prayer. May that be our longing. 
May that be what we resolve to do today and for the rest of our lives. Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, we thank you for these beautiful psalms written so many centuries ago and yet so powerful and so meaningful to our very lives now. Help us, O Lord, to feel a sense of joy and gladness whenever you call us together as your covenant people. And help us, Lord, to take refuge and to grow in grace and strength as we meet together to worship you and to hear your word proclaimed. And enable us, Lord, as we see something of the wonders of your kingdom, to give ourselves completely to your service. Glorify your name among us, for Jesus' sake. Amen. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen.